Chapter 1. Death of a TARDIS. The police box, which was not a police box at all, sped through that mysterious void where space and time are one. Inside the impossibly large, large control room, a tall, white-haired man with a deeply lined young, fa young old face was making a few final adjustments to the instruments. Despite the ultra-modern nature of his surroundings, he was dressed with old-fashioned elegance in narrow trousers, velvet smoking jacket, and a ruffled shirt. A door opened and an, an attractive, dark-haired girl appeared. She wore an abbreviated beach robe over a 20th century bathing costume and carried a big, striped beach bag. It's all in here, doctor. Sunglasses, sun lotion, water wings. The doctor smiled. You won't need water wings, Sarah. Oh, yes, I will. You said we're going swimming. You can't sink on Florana. I can sink anywhere, said Sarah pessimistically. I need a life jacket in my bath. The water on Florina is effervescent. The bubbles support you. Sounds like swimming in a, swimming in a glass of health salts. The doctor was, was in a great good humor. Was in great good humor. All right, Sarah, all right. Just wait till, you, till you've seen Florana. It's the most beautiful holiday planet in the galaxy. Sarah felt contrite. It seemed unfair to be so suspicious when the doctor was in such a holiday mood. But somehow, she just couldn't help wondering if the doctor's lavish promises about their destination were really going to be fulfilled. During their rel her relatively brief acquaintance with the doctor, the TARDIS had taken her to a particularly violent era of England's medieval past and to a London mysteriously infested with dinosaurs. The doctor had assured her that this time everything would be different. <laughs> always does that. To make up for these terrifying experiences, he was taking her to the most beautiful, the most peaceful planet in the galaxy. She noticed that a red light was flashing on the TARDIS control console. Other lights began to flicker, and needles on the instrument dials were oscillating wildly. She looked at the doctor, but he was staring blissfully into space, still summoning up the beauties of Florana. I always come away from those long golden beaches feeling a hundred years younger. Doctor, and the beauty of Florana is that, unlike your own little planet, it hasn't yet been spoiled by... Doctor, should that red light be flashing like that? And all those others. The doctor swung around and saw alarm signals registering all over the TARDIS console. He dashed frantically about the console, adjusting controls. A fuse blew with a, cackle, uh, with a crackle of sparks and a puff of smoke. The lights in the control room went dim. Sarah was frankly terrified. What is it, Doctor? What's happening? There seems to be a major power failure. Hang on, I'll cut in the emergency circuits. The doctor pulled a lever, and all at once everything turned returned to normal. The main lights came up, and the warning lights went out. That's a relief, said the doctor. If the emergency unit units hadn't worked, we'd be in real trouble. The main lights began to fade, and the emergency signals on the console started flickering once more. It's happening again, said Sarah. Do something, doctor! The doctor was leaning over the controls, frowning in concentration. For the TARDIS to fail in this way meant only one thing. Some outside force was operating against it. A sudden fierce jolt made him clutch the console for support and sent Sarah staggering. What's happened, doctor? I can tell you one thing, Sarah. We've landed. He pointed to the center column which rose and fell steadily while the TARDIS was in flight. It was motionless. One by one, the warning lights on the TARDIS console started to go out and the indicator needles on the dials crept back towards zero. The main lights grew dimmer and dimmer, and there was an uncanny silence. It's as if the TARDIS is dying, whispered Sarah. I'd better try the scanner. Well, there's still enough power to operate it, said the doctor. He threw the switch, and the scanner screen lit up. The picture was dim and fuzzy, and all it showed them was sand dunes and swirling green fog. Slowly, the picture faded, and the scanner screen went black. Fascinating, murmured the doctor. What's so fascinating about fog? Perhaps that fog is what's putting the TARDIS out of action. The concealed, the concealed lights in the TARDIS ceiling began going out one by one. Section after section of the TARDIS was plunged into darkness. Finally, one center light source was left, bathing the console, the doctor, and Sarah in a little, in a little circle of light. Then it too began to fade. Do you have any other emergency power source? asked Sarah. Yes, of course. I'll switch over to the backup system. He threw a switch and the lights came up again. Sarah smiled with relief. 
but not for too, but not for long. Slowly, the lights began to fade. Dead battery, suggested Sarah nervously. Hardly. Listen, I can't hear anything. Exactly. Neither can I. Nothing at all. Not a click or a tick. Nothing. The TARDIS is a living thing. Hundreds of complex instruments working all the time. Its energy sources are perpetual. Never stop. Well, they have now. Everything's completely dead. It's just as you said. The TARDIS is dying. The doctor looked around the control room. It was almost completely dark now, just the faintest of glimmers from the central light. Sarah, look in that locker over there. I think there should be a torch on the upper shelf. Sarah opened the locker and groped inside. She took out an enormous torch, the heavy industrial kind, covered in black rubber. She switched it on and a beam of bright light illuminated the console. Sarah felt better immediately, until the beam of the torch began slowly fading. In a matter of seconds, it had died completely and the darkness returned. The doctor was hunting inside another locker. He emerged carrying a large, old-fashioned lamp, the sort coal miners used to use. Sarah managed to smile. Don't tell me. You're going to rub it and produce a genie. The doctor held a lamp to his ear and shook it. On the contrary, I'm going to cast some light in, on our situation. He took a box of old-fashioned sulfur matches from the locker, struck one, and lit the lamp. A pool of soft yellow light bathed the area around them. Sarah breathed a sign of relief. A sigh of relief. Well, hooray for good old-fashioned oil. The doctor turned up the wick and the light grew brighter. That's better. Now we'd better, we'd better go outside and find out where we are. Sarah gave him a skeptical look. I bet it isn't Florana. He passed her the lantern. Hold this a minute, will you? The door consoles won't be working. I'll have to open them manually. He went to a tool locker in the base of the, con of the control console and took out an iron lever, rather like the starting handle, of an old-fashioned car. Crossing to the doors, the doctor slipped the handle into the wall socket and began to turn it. Slowly, the door started to open, and green fog drifted into the room. It seemed to chill the air. Sarah shivered inside her beach robe. The doctor opened the door a little wider and went outside. Nervously, Sarah followed. There was little enough to see. The TARDIS seemed to have landed in the middle of sand dunes. Their low, rounded shapes stretched away into the greenish fog. Coarse gray and crunch coarse gray sand crunched underfoot as they moved cautiously away from the TARDIS. Sarah shivered. It's so cold. Come on, said the doctor. Let's take a look around. They walked on through the dunes for quite some time. Suddenly, Sarah jumped back in terror as a menacing black figure loomed up out of the fog. The doctor held her arm. All right, Sarah. It's only a rock. It was kind. It was a kind of monolith, a fast, fantastically carved shape in black stone. He went to examine it more closely. It could be some kind of statue, or even some form of native life form that became petrified long ago. I was pretty close to being petrified myself. The doctor picked up a handful of the coarse gravel-like sand and rubbed it th thoughtfully between his fingers. This part of the planet seems quite dead. I doubt if anything has grown here for centuries. Well, unless you're planning to settle down here and raise lettuce, it doesn't seem too important. The doctor ignored her. <laughs> If the rest of the place is like this, the whole planet may be completely lifeless. Look, Doctor, we're not on some kind of scientific study expedition. All we want to do is get away from here. I quite agree. But to leave this planet, we must first understand it. Why? Think! Some power emanating from this planet has drained the TARDIS energy banks. Now, either it's a natural ph phenomenon, or somebody or something is doing it deliberately. The doctor nodded, and like some teacher whose pupil had finally come up with the answer, with the answer, exactly. Well, now, we've got that settled. Can't you just fix the TARDIS and clear out? You're missing the point, Sarah. The trouble isn't in the TARDIS. To get away from here, we've got to find whatever's blocking our energy source and neutralize it. And how are we, and how are we to do that? For the moment, I haven't the slightest idea. But unless we can do it, we're trapped. Stuck here forever? That's right, said the doctor cheerfully, so we'd better get busy. What do we do first? We start by investigating the area immediately. No, sorry, investigating the immediate area. All right, said said Sarah bravely. She shivered again, looking at the doorway, at do looking at the shadowy dunes shrouded in green fog. It was bitterly cold. I'm not exactly dressed for this climate, though, am I? What? The doctor realized Sarah was still in bathing costume and beach robe, ready for 
the promised beaches of Florana. For goodness sakes, girl, go and get something, <laughs> get on something warm. All right, don't go away, doctor, will you? The doctor, <laughs> the doctor was absorbed in examining the black monolith with his oil lamp. Sarah gave him a despairing look and hurried off towards the TARDIS. The doctor went on with his examination. The monolith could be of na natural origin. Uh, it was perfectly possible that swirling sandstorms had gradually carved the rock pillar into the, its present fantastic shape. Or it was a statue of some kind, worn away by the passage of time. Then there was... Then there was the other theory he'd mentioned to Sarah. Perhaps it was some creature of the planet, dead for untold thousands of years, petrified into its present form. Perhaps it had once been one of the planet's intelligent life forms. Absorbed in his speculations, the doctor didn't notice the black-robed figures had apparently silent... The black-robed figures had appeared silently out of the fog. They began stalking slowly towards him. End of chapter one. And the next chapter, chapter two, The Ambush.